You tired of this already? I think so. Hi, Judy Sam. Judy, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. How are you? Okay. I just met you. Oh, you did? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Has everyone had a chance to meet my lovely wife? This is issue where there's been a lot of misinformation coming from the GOP camp, uh, but it is an issue that I've been very clear from the very beginning on. It's an issue where the federal government for, you know, 50 years and longer from both the Republicans and Democrats have uh, given us regulation after regulation that has impeded the ability of the market to provide affordable health care. Uh, we do, we shoot ourselves in the foot at the state level too. And so I'm the only person who's been talking about actual solutions to our problems both at the federal and state level. And so I've said, no, we should not expand the, the Medicaid program, certainly not as it exists, but we should try and get more state policy freedom. Ideally, first best solution is to get the federal government out of the business of regulating the healthcare sector, uh, return policy to the states, but second best would be to block grants the system entirely so that we can get our money back and design our own system. Thank you. on the black boxes and cars to pay for um, roads, you know, people have said that you're in support of the black boxes on the cars to pay mileage, where we track mileage of people's cars, and obviously a lot of people who are interested in civil liberties issues find that concerning, including myself, and I'd just like to hear where you stand on that. Well, funny you should ask that, because that too <laughs> has been the subject of some GOP misinformation campaigns, but I have been consistent throughout my campaign from day one that we need to get our civil liberties back. Not just uh, not just in, in regard to the drug war, but in, but in all our all aspects of policy. And this is an area where you know I have talked about having more rational transportation policy, which means getting us back 
towards moving towards having users of the roads pay for the roads. And uh, you know how we do that is open to debate. Uh, but certainly there is no need for any black box government tracking in order to do that. Uh, so even if even if we were to use something like a miles driven tax, which I haven't endorsed, but it's an idea that's out there. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there is a very old school technology in your cars right now that will tell you how many miles. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Mine's broken. Uh, well, I guess you won't have to Ooh, pay the tax. And then we're solved with coming. Yes. Should we get out of the state alcohol business? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Not, we should get out of the. get the state out of the alcohol business, but the reason we haven't been able to is because the legislators are revenue hungry, and they don't want to let go of that revenue, but that just leads to the idea that, you know, one of the best ways we can short circuit that problem is tax reform, and the only way to uh, to break ourselves of the system where we're just, where, where we just have, uh, you know, a hundred different taxes uh, with a hundred different carve-outs is, is to simplify the tax code, make sure we have only a couple of transparent taxes with with the broad base, low tax rates, uh, and we can get out of the business of you know the government selling alcohol and the government using Gestapo tactics on women who are buying bottled water. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, what is my stance on abortion? Well, uh, there's my personal views, uh, which are somewhat different from my political views. My political views. Uh, stem from the fact that we've been fighting over this for a long time. Uh, it, it seems to me to be a pretty intractable political problem. And I think it's because we are in disagreement at a very fundamental level. And we're, when we're in such disagreement, I, I think it doesn't make sense to try and settle the matter through the current course of power of the state. And I respect people on the pro-life and pro-choice sides, but I think that the absolutism from both sides is, becoming, is ruining our political rhetoric and uh, polarizing and, uh, the, the parties, and I think it's bad for all of our policies. Yes. What do you stand on immigration? On immigration? Legal immigration. On legal, legal immigration. I think we well, should. I think we should expand immigration. immigration. Uh, I think any the vast majority of economists will tell you that more immigrants coming to America is good for America. I would love to see them settling in Virginia. Uh, you know, people come here for the economic opportunity and the opportunity for their children. And so we should make sure that we have a Virginia that's uh, welcoming to everybody, regardless of background. I think I'm the only candidate who's, one of whose parents was an immigrant. My mom is from China. Uh, where'd she go? Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I obviously represent the diversity of the state, both physically and philosophically. And so I think that, you know, the more the better, high skill, low skill, every skill, every skill level, we should have more uh, immigration so that more people, I think, I think it's, it's a, a great thing for humanity and for global prosperity. I think we should have both uh, 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 much more open immigration laws, much more liberal immigration laws, and we should have free trade so that people who aren't able to uh, immigrate here can actually partake in, a, in, a, in an open economy. And the people here who are here are illegal. I, I have no control over federal immigration policy, but I think that if you're in Virginia, that you should be brought within the law so that people aren't complaining. Uh, well, first of all, we should we have a duty to give everybody living in Virginia the equal protection of the laws. Uh, we also should bring people within the law so that uh, you know people are paying into the tax system, that they're able to to uh, to participate in the economy to the to the highest abilities rather than living in the shadows. Uh, and contribute to the culture. So I think that, you know, it's what the federal government does, I would, I would like to have some influence on that just through, the, just through being in a position to argue for, for, uh, for sensical policies. But certainly at the state level, you know, we should, have, we should have Virginia law enforcement enforcing Virginia law not becoming an arm of the you know, immigration powers and you know, just having an open society is what we're all is the most important thing that we can do. Thank you. What are the yes. first steps you would take to improving the school system? Well, I think there's two tracks of reforms that we can undertake. One is directed towards the public school systems. 
getting a lot of the administrative bloat out of the public system, uh, you know, returning to, not even returning to what the ratios, administrative, administrator and teacher ratios were a generation ago, just returning to parity will save on the order of a billion dollars a year, state and local combined, uh, getting rid of the SOLs, uh, moving to a more uh, student and teacher focused policy rather than a, a system that's run by bureaucrats for the sake of the bureaucrats. Um, and at the same time, I think we should have another track of reforms that's based on allowing people to take their kids out of failing schools or underperforming schools or schools that are, just aren't providing the services that, that parents want. And that's going to empower parents, that's going to create, enable us to foster an open and competitive marketplace in education and in everywhere, every other industry in the economy that has open and competitive markets, we get quality improvements at lower cost. And there's no reason to think that, that would be different in education. Does that mean so it could. I, I think that there's a, there's an open debate about uh, vouchers versus tax credits, and, and the, the the main issue that we want to avoid is uh, the government coming in and regulating the private marketplace for educational services, which uh, and and keep keep the regulatory process from essentially cartelizing the the uh, providers of those services, because all that's going to do is allow them to. Uh, capture all the subsidies that we have. So, so, so the most important thing is the openness and competitiveness of the marketplace uh, and, 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 and empowering parents and, and kids. And but won't sure that require vouchers? Yeah. yeah, vouchers or a tax credit system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you support decriminalization or legalization of marijuana and how do you feel about other drugs? I support full legalization of marijuana. Uh, I think that just the, the, the the evidence just provides no reason for us to be criminalizing it. Um, other drugs, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that Virginia is ready to, to move on any of the any of the hard drugs. But I certainly think that uh, the criminal approach, you know, pushing a lot of people through the criminal justice system, is the wrong approach. The war on drugs has had so many uh, deleterious consequences and created so many social pathologies. Uh, it's, it's vastly increased the amount of spending that we do, uh, undermined our civil liberties, and militarized the police. Uh, you know, we ruin a lot of people's lives and livelihoods by giving them criminal records. We reduce, uh, we, we get rid of a lot of economic activity by making them unemployable. Uh, and, you know, we increase gun violence. It has so many follow-on effects. So I think that, you know, ending the drug war and moving away from the prohibitionist mentality is the, is the only right option. Yes. Would you? Yes. Would you be in favor of having the, the laws change in, in Virginia so that the police are required to get warrants for cell phone data? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> a lot of the, a lot of the issues, a lot of the issues with regard to privacy, I think, can be solved by uh, by decoupling the information from if if it's a public if it's a public service. Uh, in many cases, you can. Uh, anonymize whatever data, make sure it's not being collected by the government, uh, outsource a lot of the data, uh, outsource a lot of the services so that private the private uh, marketplace can provide different service providers who can grant different levels of privacy. Uh, and anytime the government wants needs that information for a criminal investigation, they have to go through the courts to get it. What's your reaction to being the first libertarian candidate to be endorsed by a major newspaper in Virginia? I, I just think it's, it's, uh, it's, for one thing, I just appreciate the open-mindedness of uh, the, the Danville Register and Bee. I think that it, it means a lot to the political process to have a third party that's uh, running a serious campaign, a mainstream campaign that's getting the attention of the media. And I think just moving forward, uh, we're going to get more and more of those endorsements because the, the system is broken, it's dysfunctional, and it's because the two parties have become too buddy-buddy with each other uh, and kind of in league with each other. They know that they're going to, uh, you know, switch off power every few years, uh, but they're, they're both playing a big money game and, and no longer governing in the, in the public interest. And so uh, the media recognizes this and certainly voters do as well. And so when the, the two major parties are nominating candidates who are uh, who really embody what's wrong with their respective parties, then there is this huge vacuum. And uh, the media 
the media is recognizing that just as much as the voters are. And so it's, I think it's, I think it's uh, foretells of more to come. What do you, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> what do you think about private prisons where the government ensures that there's customers for that company? Uh, well, so so there is a real problem with the uh, prison industrial complex and the the, uh, the the money that's involved, and and a lot of the incentives are sort of to to keep things like the drug war going, to keep a pipeline of, of customers. I don't know. I don't like calling that. <laughs> um, but certainly, certainly is something that you know needs to be reformed, and it's certainly you know the, the best the best way to reduce the amount of incarceration. We have is to end the drug war. Uh, it, it also, you know, the number of it, it takes resources away from a lot of things, not just through incarceration, but uh, but the enforcement costs. And, and you know, it, when you look at what's happening with public defenders' offices and, and policing of uh, violent crimes, uh, those resources can be used much better. Uh, you know, better funding. You know, getting rid of the drug war would essentially reduce the strain on public defenders' offices and prosecutors' offices, uh, policing of violent crimes, can we can focus on them instead of, you know, uh, the, the, the amount of, of, of uh, police attention on drugs is just inor inordinate. And part of the reason for that is the, the money game, the asset forfeiture laws, uh, and it just creates totally perverse incentives. And so, um, you know, I think that there's a lot we can do throughout the criminal justice system. And, and part of that also has to do with uh, reforming the thresholds for grand larceny uh, and other things that affect the disenfranchisement of a lot of people. Um, yes. Terrible question for you. How do you feel about legalized prostitution? Uh, it's not. A, it's not a terrible question. I mean, it's 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 something that you know. I don't. I don't foresee the General Assembly taking that up. But I will tell you that the, there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, for the for the same reason that the, the prohibitionist mentality. Uh, pushes things underground. It makes it more difficult and dangerous for the people involved on both sides of the transaction. And so there are a lot of uh, reasonable arguments uh, in favor of, of taking a different approach. How will you make fresh foods more afford affordable and available, especially in schools? Uh, well, I think uh, one of the one of the issues with fresh foods is uh, you know there's, there's there's issues throughout the state with um, you know a lot of farmers wanting to farm freedom and things like that. But generally speaking, um, you know, I, I don't want to do anything that, that's basically making people, make, making the government make choices for people, you know, having them eat particular foods and whatnot. But one of the reasons that we don't have that there are food deserts and things like that is because of uh, zoning laws and land use regulations and, uh, you know, restricted markets. So a lot of times, big grocery chains use the regulatory process to keep uh, upstart groceries, grocers out of the business, uh, and oftentimes it's, it's, those, it's those entrepreneurs and innovators who are trying to provide fresher foods, things like that. And so, you know, in, with regard to the schools, the procurement process is, is, a, is very cronious, uh, and, and so that's something where, where a lot of reforms could take place as well. Within the Commonwealth of Virginia, do you feel that the EPA has not or has not gone far enough or has overreached concerning stormwater regulations among localities? Uh, again, I think, I think that's a, a uh, issue that's best addressed at the local level. I mean, I don't, I don't really think it makes sense for the EPA to be engaging in much regulation of in-state problems. You know, if there is, if there is, uh, if there is uh, pollutants going across state lines and things like that, then it makes sense for uh, federal regulations, but but lo local stormwater runoff and things like that uh, are best left at the state level and local level. Rob, I think you've got some reporters here okay. who want to talk to you. All right, so let me just say a, a huge thank you for, for everybody who's come out today. And again, it's, it, it means a lot to me that you're showing up and that you've really gotten behind my campaign. And so, 24 hours from now, uh, we'll be winding down a day of, of, uh, of voting, and, and then I, and I invite you all to join us at our, our election night celebration. It's going to be in Richmond at 
it's a tobacco company, it's, it's in the Saco Slip. Uh, so I hope to see you all there. If you can't uh, come out, I, I, I want you to know how much I appreciate all the hard work you've done and that you're going to do tomorrow. So thank you so much. Now I'll, I'll do the interviews. Great, thanks so much. Yeah. Good luck. Okay.